Our first reading is from the prophet Isaiah. This is chapter 60, beginning at the first verse. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your son shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come. Oh, how nice. There's that. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. This is the word. Okay. Um, somebody is still... Unmuted. Let me see if I can fix that there. I think I did. Um, so I thought I'd just give a short reflection on each of the readings rather than a formal sermon. And this first reading uh, from Isaiah comes from the post-exilic period. That is the period after the Israelites had been in Babylon and they're returning to Jerusalem only to find that Jerusalem is um, a mere shadow of its former self. Um, it has been desolated. And the, all they see ahead of them is this great task of rebuilding. But yet, what they know and what they see and what they feel and what they experience is that the light of God is still with them. And so there's this beautiful um, poem, really, a poem that um, uh, is an ode to the light of God that is gonna lead them into a rebuilding of Jerusalem. It is an ode to Jerusalem. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And even though darkness seems to cover the earth, even though darkness seems to cover Jerusalem, even though you can barely perceive the former glory that it was, the prophet knows, and the prophet is telling the people that Jerusalem will be rebuilt, and Jerusalem once again will be the holy city that it used to be. And it's the light of God, it's the light of God that bursts through this darkness, and that will become a light to all the nations once again. And so the question is, why do we Christians read this? You know, this was um, seven centuries or so before the birth of Christ that Isaiah was writing this. Well, we read it because we know that the real light of God, the light of God that we celebrate coming into hu humanity on Christmas day is the light of Jesus. And it is the new Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem that is the person of Jesus Christ that comes into the world. And he is the true light, the true light to all nations. And while it is true, of course, that Jerusalem was rebuilt and Jerusalem did uh, achieve some of its former glories, and it continues to be a place that people flock to from, from all faiths, uh, what we celebrate as Christians um, on the Feast of the Epiphany is that it's that child Jesus born in the manger, that child Jesus, which we'll hear in a few minutes, that the Magi come to visit and are just, um, their breath is taken away as they see this new king. This Jesus is the true light of God, and no longer will God inhabit a temple of stone and jewels, but rather God will inhabit a human being the human being whose nativity we just celebrated this past Christmas season. So now then, let us turn to our psalm, Psalm 72, verses 1 to 7. 
and 10 to 14. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son, that he may rule your people righteously and the poor with justice, that the mountains may bring prosperity to the people and the little hills bring righteousness. He shall defend the needy among the people. He shall rescue the poor and crush the oppressor. He shall live as long as the sun and moon endure from one generation to another. He shall come down like rain upon the mown field, like showers that water the earth. In his time shall the righteous flourish. There shall be abundance of peace till the moon shall be no more. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall pay tribute, and the kings of Arabia and Saba offer gifts. All kings shall bow down before him, and all the nations do him service. For he shall deliver the poor who cries out in distress, and the oppressed who has no helper. He shall have pity on the lowly and the poor. He shall redeem their lives from oppression and violence and dear shall their blood be in his sight. So this Psalm, Psalm 72, is known as a royal Psalm. It is a Psalm that was sung at the coronation of kings, kings of Judah. And so after Jerusalem is rebuilt and there are once again kings of Jerusalem, the psalmist recalls the days of David and Solomon when the kings prevailed doing their best over the people with a sense of righteousness and justice. And of course, none of the kings of Israel, David included, ever met the standard articulated in this psalm. But this psalm is a beautiful articulation of the values that we expect in human leaders, leaders who will set aside their own interests and rule with a true sense of God's righteousness, with a particular concern for the poor, with a particular concern for bringing prosperity to all people, for a particular concern for the needy among the people. This is a great um, contribution to Western political philosophy that the Hebrew people have given us in the Old Testament, because it articulates still what we expect in our political leaders. And even though we obviously no longer are ruled by monarchies and kings and queens are foreign to our sense of government, nevertheless, this psalm still is um, gives voice to a much needed sense of the kinds of qualities we expect in human leaders. And now as we look forward to what will, I'm sad to say, be a contentious and hard fought election year in this country, whether you are a Democrat, a Republican, an independent or none of the above, I hope that as Christians, we can all agree that this Psalm gives voice to the deep qualities that we expect in all earthly leaders, whether they be presidents, senators, congressmen, or local officials. This quality of aligning our hearts with God, ruling with a true sense of righteousness, caring for the poor and the needy and those on the margins of society, and creating a community where all can share in the prosperity that we have been given and that is ours as a gift and not ours as a right. And so the reason we still um, sing this psalm and claim this psalm as our own is because it is a pearl, it is a gem of the qualities that we expect in human leadership. And of course, the only king who could fully and completely li live into this was the king that we worship in the manger, which brings us to our gospel reading. This is the famous story of the Magi from Matthew's gospel. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? 
for we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, the wise men left for their own country by another road. This is the gospel of the Lord. It's a story, of course, that we all know so well, and we've seen Christmas pageants, and we've sung songs, and many of us uh, do other rites. Uh, in the Episcopal Church, uh, on the Epiphany, it's common to chalk our um, uh, the thresholds over our houses with the names of the three kings, which by legend were Balthazar, Casper, and Melchior. Uh, and we do that as a, um, as a sign of good luck for the coming year. And so there are all these um, legends and rites and rituals and pageants around this beautiful story, this story of how all the world came to learn of the birth of this child and all the world is sort of represented in these three magi who come to, to Bethlehem, who follow this star, magi, um, which from which our word magician comes, um, you know, is trans sometimes translated as wise men. Uh, sometimes it's translated as magician. Sometimes it's translated as astrologer because it definitely has a connotation of uh, those who studied and followed the stars, which is exactly why it was a star that they looked for to lead them to Bethlehem. But I think just stepping back from this very well-known story to sort of it, uh, plumb its deeper meaning, what I see here is that um, the birth of this child who is God, who comes into the world so humbly, is something that all the world is invited to search for, just like these three wise men they somehow learn of this birth of this child. It somehow comes to them by rumor, by message. We're not quite sure. And then they see a star, but they have to search. They have to search for the light of God. And they have to be faithful to trying to find this light, this light of goodness and beauty and truth and justice. And they have to search to find it. And when they find it, they have to respond by offering all the gifts that they have. And they bring all the gifts that they have to this child, this child of God. And then they pledge their allegiance, their faithfulness, their very lives to this person. That's the one response that we can have to God coming into the world, the response represented by the Magi. But then there are the Herods of the world, because Herod is the other main character in this story. Herod representing those who are not interested in listening to God, who are more preoccupied with their own sense of pride, their own sense of power, their own sense of, I know what I need to survive in this world and who are therefore threatened by God coming into this world and who enlist others who are 
threatened by God coming into this world and who do terrible things in order to prevent God from coming into this world, which we, of course, hear about as the gospels unfold over time. And we look forward towards the transfiguration and Lent and Holy Week and Easter. So what we see here in this story are two different ways of responding to God coming into the world, a faithful response, the response of the Magi who along with Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the angels are celebrating this and seeking to guide their lives by God's presence, or we can respond by being threatened and consumed by our own pride. And that's the choice that we have. That is the sort of existential choice of faith. And that is, um, that is the story of the epiphany. But what we always know is there is this light that shines through the darkness if we are but willing to look for it, to search for it, and to follow it.